you have some family history with stock investing as well. This Dan, the family joke because we were traders from way back. Yeah. So, well, my grandfather, Russell, was the first to go in the securities business, which he did in 1925. Uh-huh. Roaring 20s and the crash of 29 and the Great Depression in the securities business. I just, as a kid, thought that was so fascinating. And my dad would roll his eyes because he's heard the stories too many times. So you grew up with some stories of 1929, what it was like. Right. The great wisdom I was getting, not realizing at the time, was to always ask what could go wrong. And the other thing was savings. So with the depression, you paid cash on the barrel head. Corey, tell me more about your journey. I got a call from a headhunter in Omaha asking me if I'd be interested in interviewing at a company called Berkshire Hathaway run by Warren Buffett. And I said, I had never, never heard of either one of those, either Berkshire or Warren Buffett. <laughs> and uh, and he, he told me a little bit about it. I said, sure, I'll interview. And, and that's how I got started. Welcome to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. How to make it, save it, keep it. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question. What it means to live a rich life beyond money. My guests share their practices, principles, and evergreen wisdom. I'm your host, Bogumil Baranowski, author, TEDx speaker, investor, and a founding partner of Seacard Associates, a boutique investment firm founded in New York City. Join me on this quest to unearth the wisdom of the ages. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you're tuning into my podcast. For your convenience, the show is available on a multitude of platforms, including Spotify, Apple, Google, Audible, and many more. If you want to keep up with all new episodes, and there's so many more in the queue, make sure you subscribe and please do share it with friends and family. Review it and rate it if you can. Every little gesture matters, and I thank you for it. If you'd like to know more about me, or if you're interested in getting in touch, simply Google my name and it will lead you straight to my website. There is a contact form there or check notes to this episode for links. I love hearing how you listen to my podcast on your walks, hikes, alone times, drives, trips, and more. I trust that my guests and I are a wonderful company on those adventures. I also enjoy reading how some of you are rehearsing and answering some questions that I ask my guests. I love hearing that. If you're new to the show, please scroll down and check out all the amazing guests I've had over the last few months. If you are serious about investing, money wisdom, wealth, and living a better life, you'll find plenty of episodes with some incredible ideas. For those who enjoy reading thoughtful pieces, I regularly write articles on Substack, which I'm sure you'd find insightful. Find me there and follow me as well. Finally, I'd like to mention my latest book, Crisis Investing. It's a collection of 100 essays that I penned for our clients during the tumultuous times of the global COVID pandemic. These essays are both timely and timeless, providing a unique perspective on navigating through crises. They were never meant to be published, but here they are available to you. Please find the book on Amazon. The book has already received considerable recognition and much love, ranking among the top releases on Amazon in its initial weeks. Thank you for your support and for being a part of my listener community. Now, without further ado, let's dive into today's episode. My guests today are Daniel Pecco, Chairman, Chief Investment Officer, Author, and Corey Wren, President and CEO. They're both Chairman and President of Pecco and Company. If you are a Berkshire and Buffett fan, this episode is for you. We'll go on a trip back in time to the early days of Buffett's Berkshire. Both my guests have been going to Berkshire's annual meetings since the 1980s. And one of my guests actually worked for Buffett and was checking tickets and letting attendees in at the annual meetings. They have some incredible stories to share. Daniel Picot is a Harvard graduate whose insights have been featured in the New York Times, Money Magazine, Grants Interest Rate Observer, Outstanding Investor Digest, and Omaha World Herald. He has worked in investing for 30 plus years and is chairman of Pico and Company. For nine years, Corey Wren was an internal auditor at Berkshire Hathaway. Wren is now the president of Pico and Company. Wren received his MBA from University of Nebraska at Omaha. 
Today we talk about everything from Dan's grandfather's tales of 1920s bull market and the 1929 market crash, Corey's years at Berkshire, to lessons from almost four decades of Berkshire's annual meetings and more. They both share their childhood and upbringing stories. They also share memories of those early Berkshire meetings. We talk about the peculiar nature of the insurance company that Berkshire is. My guests highlight Buffett's discipline in waiting for the right time to buy. We talk about inflation, perspectives on forecasts and predictions. We also talk about Buffett's advice for those starting out in life and investing. My guests talk about Buffett's thoughts on taxes. We talk about the ethical standards upheld by Buffett and Munger. And finally, we conclude our discussion with the definition of success, but also a little bit of a golden nugget from one of my guests. So please stay tuned until the end of the episode. Please help me welcome Dan Picot and Corey Wren. Dan, Corey, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. You're welcome. Hot summer day here. So well, wonderful. Well, as you both know, I'm I'm very familiar with your work, with your book, and I read it a while ago, and I reread it recently, and I wanted to chat with you. You're experts on on Buffett and Berkshire, and you've known the company for so many years. You've been to so many meetings, and and you, Corey, you actually worked for Berkshire at some point, and I'll ask you about in a second. But if you don't mind, I like to start those conversations talking about childhood and upbringing, if you indulge me. And I'm curious how you think that time for both of you influenced your relationship with money and investing and led you to a career path that you're on. And yeah, let's get started at the beginning, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, if I try this, Dan, I'll go ahead. And uh, uh, I appreciate on your website, you talked about your grandfathers and how they influenced you. And That's true. My grandfathers. And my uh, actually great great grandfather left Switzerland when he was fourteen. Uh -huh. Was the old stepmother, and came all the way to America on his own. And he was a mule driver on the Erie Canal, moving the barges up and down. And he uh -huh. saw a mill in Atlanta. And he ended up being a fur trader on the Missouri River. He was one of the earliest settlers in what's now called Sioux City, Iowa, which is where I live. And and you have some family history with stock investing as well. Right. So the family joke is we were traders from way back. As a, well, my grandfather, Russell, was the first to go in the securities business, which he did in 1925. Uh -huh. Roaring 20s and the crash of 29 and the Great Depression in the securities business. I just, as a kid, thought that was so fascinating. And my dad would roll his eyes because he'd heard the stories too many times. So you grew up with some stories of 1929, what it was like and how they managed through that period. And I, th I think, you know, we haven't experienced anything like it, like it since, and I hope we never will. But I think it, it left some mark on a lot of people. Right. The great wisdom I was getting, not realizing at the time, was to always ask what could go wrong. And that became part of my brain operating system. I just think that way. And then it's just got inculcated in my mind way back. And the other thing was savings. So with the depression, you paid cash on the barrel head. Uh -huh. That's how you did business. And so that was inculcated. So I had a little doggy bank, I remember, that I would love to fill it up with coins from shoveling snow or mowing lawns. And I had a paper route. So I liked the idea of service for money. And then yeah. I keep, oh boy, that, that clicked. And then I love filling up the bank and shaking it, trying to guess how much money was in there. And dumping it out, counting it up. Uh huh. So I liked money. That was pretty clear. Yeah. Well, then you chose the right career path, and and I can relate to the two lessons. The one is saving. You you mentioned my grandparents, and I think they instilled in me the idea of of always saving and having some money aside, not really counting on any help from outside. It's all on you. And then the idea that things can go wrong. I think from the very beginning, I remember my first conversation with my future business partner, Francois Sicard, I asked him all the questions about what can go wrong, how you can lose money in investing. And I think he found it refreshing that this 20 some year old kid, you know, 20 years ago, now uh, wanted to know what can go wrong first instead of how I can get rich fast. But yeah. that's, that's something I can relate to. So Corey, you now, go ahead. Something I was thinking about saving, what it taught me is that was empowerment. Right. So oh. like, okay, with savings, I can go buy something. I mm -hmm. can, so I just felt the power of it. And but then, you, you, you had, you have to save first. You can't pull out a credit card. The mindset was to, you have to save, save first. Yeah, I like that. So our other book is saving, spending, investing, giving. Uh-huh. Those are the four things you can do with the dollar. Uh-huh. Saving must come first. 
then that empowers all the decisions you can make on the others. Yeah. Right. So, so you're helping me qual- qualify at an early age, the insights were given to me and then over lifetime, they become clear. They, they served you very well. We'll come back to it, but I think we, we get shaped in those early years of our life and that helps us in the future to operate and make decisions. And especially if you choose the career in investing, I think those principles we pick up at the beginning, they matter. Yeah. Corey, tell me more about your journey. How, how did you end up working for Berkshire and how did you yeah, get that, into the money business? <laughs> yeah, that was a very, very strange path for me because I grew up in a very small agrarian community in southeastern South Dakota, a little town called Freeman, South Dakota. And uh, my mother was the breadwinner. She ran a small restaurant and had uh, six kids. And so money was always tight. And we were all involved in the business. I, was, I worked there. Um, worked a lot of different jobs, but I was always really fascinated by it. I think probably because I was always there because my mom was always working. If I wanted to see her, that's where I went. Um, so I did, I really didn't really even know what stocks were until I went to college and, uh, got introduced in a, in a, um, investing class, you know, throughout, throughout the time I was there. And after I graduated, I worked as a CPA. Mm-hmm. That's actually when I met Dan. I was working in Sioux City, and he was my stockbroker. That's yeah. interesting. Late, and uh, we had some interesting stocks that we selected. And then I was working. Um, I was looking for something different. I realized I didn't want to do that kind of work my whole life. And I got a call from a headhunter in Omaha asking me if I'd be interested in interviewing at a company called Berkshire Hathaway, run by Warren Buffett. And I said. I had never never heard of either one of those, either Berkshire or Warren Buffett. <laughs> and uh, and he, he told me a little bit about it. I said, sure, I'll interview. And, and that's how I got started. And of course, once I was there, I got very interested in investing. And yeah. I think mostly I liked, you know, the investing part was interesting, but I really loved the businesses and the people I met running the businesses. Mm-hmm. You know, at that time, they bought Nebraska Furniture Mart and I met the Blumkins and I went out to see and I saw Chuck Huggins at Cheese Candies and Stan Lipsy at Buffalo News and um, and um, uh, Don Worcester at Nebraska Furniture Mart and or uh, I'm, a, I'm sorry, National Indemnity. Anyway, those those people were, ran those businesses and they ran them so well. It was it was it was amazing to me to watch them work and and you know I, and so to me business and investing are intricately you, you know entwined. So. I don't know if it's investing or business. I'm more interested. I, I guess I'm more interested in in business. So, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. you're touching on so many interesting things, and I see in my journey that at first you think that investing is about the numbers, and then you realize no, it's about the people that are running the businesses. The, yeah. the numbers can be you know made up and manipulated in many different ways, but it's the people that you can trust and that are running those businesses day in and day out that matter the most. And the second thing, you know, business owner or stock owner, I think the mindset is that in the stock market, you go in and you buy small pieces of businesses or not so small if you have billions under management. But at the end of the day, you own the actual businesses. And I think that's that's the difference between you know, a speculator and somebody that's in, in it for the long run. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Can we talk about those early Berkshire meetings? So in your book, you have year after year, and it's fun to see that how the number of people is growing. The The venues are changing, and there's some jokes about the kinds of venues that they, they chose. What are your memories of those days? There were not so many people. I think there were hundreds at the beginning when you started coming. And, and it remind yeah, me, think, which one was the first year for each of you? Yeah, the first. The, this is Corey. The first meeting I went to was in 1984. It was actually at the Red Lion Inn, which is downtown. I think they rented like two rooms. And I, I, you know, obviously my memory is a bit hazy uh, and it gets hazier as you get older. But I, I think there might've been 50 to 60 people there and um, it was quite intimate. It was pretty, it was a pretty short meeting. Uh, You know, it was in my mind. Over the years, Warren got more comfortable with the meetings. He didn't seem very comfortable in that meeting to me. I, I just, that's the one thing I remembered. It was like almost um, like he was eager for it to be over. And I, mm-hmm. I don't remember that after that because the next year I went over to the uh, Jaws and Art Museum. But, the, and I think that's the first one you were at, wasn't it, Dan? Right. I came when the Jaws and Art Museum was the venue. And yeah. that was, well, I had read the book, The Muddy Masters by John Trade. There's profiles of nine brilliant investors. 
Hmm? A light bulb went on. I'm going back to, to school and I will study these investors. They'll be my professors and we'll see where that goes. And so Warren Buffett's at the top of the list. And uh, so I went to the annual meeting with like 20 questions written out, uh-huh. I'm really treating it like a student, uh-huh. going, which is why we coined the term, the university of Berkshire Hathaway, a place to really go learn about business. And uh, I was shaking like a leaf when I got up to ask my question. Mm-hmm. Their answers were just brilliant. You know, their, their intelligence was obvious so immediately. And uh, I, you know, I went to Harvard as an undergrad and it reminded me of being at Harvard again, just these shining, brilliant minds sharing whatever it is you want to know about. So I was hooked that this is something for me. I will do this every year. Did you know about Buffett before you picked up that book? No, not really. So his national profile is fairly low still at that point. I had a chance to ask a question this year at the meeting. I don't know if you were there and I was also shaking and doing my best. <laughs> and and I didn't expect to be the one asking. A friend told me, let's just put our names down. And, and it was a little lottery. And I think 20 or so of us out of the 40,000. And I had a chance to ask a question in the room. So I felt like a lottery winner. And I asked about a hundred year vision. We work with families. We invest for the long run, multi-generational wealth. Or if the wealth was created this time, this in this lifetime, the aspiration is to, to make it last multiple generations. So I was curious about their hundred year vision and they both really took their time and, and talked about different aspects and, and they included Ben Graham in the conversation. And it feels like they're really talking just to you in that very moment. They are giving you the answer and it makes you feel heard and noticed and appreciated. And I, I, I really you know admire that in them, how they have a very personal touch when it comes to those questions. I was going to ask you about those early days. So now looking back, things that it was obvious, the success of Berkshire was obvious. You know, you have two bright people running a business, collecting uh, another, more businesses with very bright people running them. What was it like at the time? Was it fairly clear to you that you're sitting in meetings and, and book question to both of you that you're witnessing something that will become really a massive corporation at some point? Not, well, this is Corey, not, not at all, really. I didn't, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, I, 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 I couldn't see that happening. I thought, you know, that that the business was already pretty big, and I, I couldn't really see it getting a lot bigger. Uh-huh. But um, I do remember, you know, he had talked about a strategic plan once in one of the annual reports, and saying occasionally something will pop up when he was asked about a strategic plan about what they might do. Um, but I think, you know, in my mind, the biggest change or the biggest difference. Um, the big moments came when he hired like Mike Goldberg, mm-hmm. uh, G. Jane, and Constantini Ordano. Uh, Mike came in and, and really, I don't know, professionalized, if that's the word, the insurance companies. National Indemnity was kind of a specialty lines insurance company, and it did a few things. and But it wasn't really, you know, out there going for it. It was a lot in the transportation business. They did a lot of truck uh, insurance and stuff like that. And then Mike came in, it was right during the hard market in the, in the mid eighties. And he really kind of ramped it up. Um, and then of course you, you've probably heard all the things that Warren has talked about Ajit, uh, Ajit came in and, and really helped establish that huge reinsurance business. And so did, uh, Dinos when he came in and, and did the large risk division. Um, so in my mind, that's when things really seemed to really ramp up, um, and I think, you know, really what Warren needed were people that were, could keep up with him or almost keep up with him uh, mm-hmm. intellectually. And, and these three guys could. And uh, I remember talking to Dinos about risk selection at Berger, and he kind of drew a diagram and he said, uh, let's assume on the Y axis, this is, you know, or, or the X axis, this is risk. He said, uh, Mike is here closest to the Y axis. And then I'm here or, or then Ajit's here. And then I'm here. And if you go way out here, that's Warren. He's willing Listen. to take, he's willing <laughs> to take a lot more risk than any of us. And, uh, so I think just bringing him the ideas, bringing him the idea flow, that was, that was the moment. And, and when I was, when I was talking to them, I realized this could be a really, really big company. And I think, um, you know, the establishment of that business and the establishment, you know, bringing in all that money, all that flow help Warren leverage, leverage that amazing intellect of his. Yeah, ben. I think it's a big insight there, Bobby Mel. So, so Don Worcester and uh, Dinos and Mike Goldberger in the past, I don't think people know them as well. 
Dietz, of course, has stayed, so he's promoted and seen every meeting. Oh, but, Donna's still there. I think Donna's still there. Yeah. Was he still there? Okay. But in any case, that uh, insurance companies were you know, kind of messy. They had some big losses. They had some horrible years, really up and down. And then professionalization of the whole insurance operation couldn't do, right? He, he could actually understand what needed to be done. Right. These are the guys who came in and put it into place. They built the machine. And in our he, book, we estimate that float that they created Mm-hmm. Leverage the returns of Berkshire about one and a half to one. So if you bought the S E index and earn ten percent a year, but you had a float characteristic machine mm-hmm. like Berkshire, then you earn about fifteen percent a year. Charlie Munger said it's like a hedgehog. Uh-huh. We had a good idea, but we did it really well. So a large part of their outperformance is this one idea. Create a yeah. float machine and then don't screw it up. So for the benefit of the audience and for those that are less familiar with how an insurance company works, can you walk us through it, how, how the float grid gets created and how it benefits a company? And, and usually insurance companies are not as adventurous with their investments as Berkshire is. I think that's important to mention too, but I'll let you take it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, I like to think of insurance as like okay, a lake that has a river that comes out of it and a river that goes out of it <laughs> on one side. And so the premium comes in on one side and then over time you pay claims and that's coming out the other side. So to the extent that you pay less um, in claims than you do in premiums, those are including expenses. Those are the profits that build up and create the float. Now, additionally, you may lose money on claims, but if you pay it out over a long enough time period, um, that also creates float. So um, the more premiums you write, the more money comes in and the slower you pay it out, the bigger the float that can be created. So um, to Berkshire's credit, I think they've written <clears throat> over time, their business has always been profitable. So that creates this um, amazing vessel <clears throat> that 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 has all this money that you can use basically in, indefinitely and forever. And that money is more precious than equity because you're not distributing that to any equity holders except for the existing equity holders. And it's better than debt because you don't pay anything for it. So <laughs> it's an amazing thing. And I think in today's world, to be in the insurance business, you have to have um, a really, really sound underwriting, really good technology, or a huge capital advantage. And Berkshire has that huge capital advantage, right? Yeah. And so they see a lot of deals and they get a lot more business um, because of that. And when a G wants to write a big, big bucket of business, like they talked about writing a, a hurricane insurance in Florida this year. Yeah. And they, yeah. I think they said they could lose 15 billion or make 7 billion. So that means they wrote a $22 billion policy, meaning they were getting almost 33% rate online, which is unbelievable. And you mm-hmm. can only do that. You can only do that if you have the capital strength and, and, and the money in hand. Um, yeah, so, so float is, float is a beautiful thing. Uh, um, but it, it requires a lot of, it requires a lot of discipline. And that's mm-hmm. one of the things that Berkshire always had. When I was back in the day, I don't know if this is still true. Berkshire had a philosophy that in the insurance company, they had a no layoff policy. Mm-hmm. So they created an incentive to ensure that people did not feel the need to grow the business to keep their jobs. And I think that's a big deal. I, I think there are a lot of insurance companies at the time, at least, that were set up so that growth was really important, and that's how management was measured. Uh, they, you know, Warren. I think Warren saw that. You know, he understands incentives probably better than anybody, and um, he set up a system so that didn't happen, and that's worked brilliantly for them. Yeah. So to summarize, there's two key elements to insurance. One is the underwriting, right? Creating policies to create the float. And the other is investing. Mm-hmm. And as you said, most insurance companies just buy bonds. Some may venture into real estate. They need relatively stable assets that they can liquidate so they can pay the claims. Mm-hmm. The regulators are on this, so it's not like no one's paying attention. You have yeah. to work within the bounds of regulation. But if, if you exceed the, the levels of reserves required to support your book of business, that excess can be vested even longer term. Mm-hmm. Berkshire exceeds amounts they need to cover their liabilities a huge amount. So they, the National Indemnity actually owns the Burlington Northern Railroad. What insurance company actually owns a railroad? Because if I, you have a bunch of claims, you can't liquidate that. But if I, your scale is such that you've already 
satisfied those reserve requirements mm-hmm. do the next thing and the next thing and then ultimately on a railroad it's just incredible yes it's nice underwriting it's side and i want to second what Corey said so as the reserves come in if you underwrite badly and the claims uh-huh. exceed the premiums that come in you drain the lake and that happens periodically insurance companies blow up it's because their underwriting's on sale mm-hmm. here it's much like the stock market so in uh, industry is hot and people want to fight for business. They have more capital than they need and they're competing on price and they could get say high returns in the bond market. So the early eighties, remember interest rates were 15% mm-hmm. the prime rate that the joke was insurance companies were underwriting, burning buildings so they could go get the investment income. But that is something like what was hit, but that's true. Yeah. So they lost their underwriting discipline and it, within a few years that came home to roost. So a number of companies blew up doing that. So what Corey is sharing is by the guaranteed employment policy, Buffett's making it clear, this is not about growing premiums. This is about underwriting profitably. Mm-hmm. The quality. Profit, they're all going to be happy. If the rates are too low, we won't, we won't do business. I, I also think, uh, Mill, I think it was, they were, they were helped to some extent by, uh, insurance regulations in Nebraska. I think, um, at that time, they did allow insurance companies to invest more in equities mm-hmm. in other states. And probably that's why, that's probably why they were domiciled there, I guess. They, and they stayed. Yeah, they stayed there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking how now that we've had bank runs recently in the U.S., which is uh, something that hasn't happened in the U.S. in a long time. I grew up in Poland and I remember in the 90s we had bank runs and we had hyperinflation. So some of the things my colleagues read about, I, I've seen them life, mm-hmm. which expanded my range of uh, you know outcomes, my imagination allows. But with an insurance company, you, you don't run the same risk. As you mentioned, there might be some moments when the lake gets drained, but you don't have a situation where um, people, uh, you have an equivalent of a bank run in that sense. It's not exactly. something that exactly. could happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, I do just want to mention in the early 80s, insurance companies were underwater. Of it's course. Just, trades mm-hmm. went up, their bond portfolios went down. Mm-hmm. If they had to mark to market. It would have been a slew of bankruptcies in the insurance industry. So somewhat similar to Silicon Valley Bank. It, it could happen. Oh, I see what you mean. Not a bank run, but a, a balance sheet. Not a bank sheet, run, but a balance, a, balance sheet crisis. Well, since we're talking about that, uh, there was a moment when the rates went to zero during COVID. And it's a situation that we also haven't experienced much in the past, if at all, for such a prolonged period of time. But there was a talk of negative interest rates. And how does an insurance business operate in a negative interest rate environment? Basically, the float, the lake is working against you. You don't want to have a big lake if the if you have negative interest rates. But I'm curious if you have any thoughts. But when we have negative interest rates, I think a lot of things make no sense no, anymore. Yeah, I would. I agree. That how do you disc future cash flows using negative interest rates? I guess you just don't. <laughs> and I think, you know, really showed, you know, I think right now you're seeing some in some insurance companies, especially I think in the life side, where they did do a lot of bond, you're seeing some weakness in those operations because they have low interest rate bonds on their balance sheets and interest rates have gone up so dramatically. So I don't know if we'll ever see if any, any of the life insurance companies are swimming naked or not, but they, you know, they very well could be because they, they mismanaged that risk. But um, I, I don't, I think the only thing you can do in an environment like that is just to have really short-term paper. And I think that's what really good managers did, or they invested in, you know, equities when they were some sort of equity portfolio. But yeah, I agree. I, you, you can't, you can't make a lot of money investing in this. <laughs> <interest rates. laughs> and, yeah. and I think, you know, I think uh, rates went up. So uh, premiums have to go higher. So part of the equation is you want to have some underwriting profit, but you also want to have uh, investment income also so, to supplement that. So obviously uh, rates probably went up. Insurance rates went up. That's true. You both talked about discipline, and I want to explore the whole idea because I think the big theme reading your book is that Buffett had an Im- Im- incredible discipline. He was able to wait and sit it out time after time when he didn't like the valuations of the businesses he was looking at, and he would allow the cash to accumulate. Even even recently, he's sitting on a lot of cash. Can you talk about that discipline? How do you remember that in the early days and how it has changed over time? I feel like it, it's a big secret to his success that he could really wait. Yeah, well, I think one of the coolest things about University of Berkshire Hathaway is our fourth appendix. Uh-huh. Track the stock bond cash ratios for Berkshire over the last 35 years. 
and he's always got cash. So mm-hmm. 5% seemed to be the low end and it got as high as 30 to 40% cash at different times. So okay. there's a big variance, but there's always some cash. So I think the first thing is to realize, well, this is, works on personal finance as well as corporate finance. What's the minimum cash level you need to survive no matter what happens? And then don't I like, like, don't, I like that don't, idea. Don't, don't give up the long-term potential of compounding. Mm-hmm. Too close on your short-term cash, emergency cash. Don't do it. So Buffett always has that buffer. And with the insurance companies, he said publicly, you know, 20 billion is kind of his number. Probably higher than that now, Corey, wouldn't it be? I would guess, yeah. Five, yeah. And then the rest of it, um, you know, probably his best metaphor is you're, you're buying hamburger, right? <laughs> you want more hamburger. You can want more hamburger. So do you want higher prices or lower prices? I want low prices. You want lower prices. Hamburger is high. I just eat hot dogs today. But when it's low, I'll back up the truck. So I was going to mention this. Morgan Household wrote The Psychology of Money. Mm-hmm. You know, great writer, wonderful book. And I like the way he expresses his ideas. And he talks about volatility being the fee for being a long-term investor. So instead of thinking as a problem, just think of it as a cost. Stay with it. But there'll be times when I'm down 20, 30%. My stomach will be churning. And that's just the cost of, of it being in the game. But my suggestion would be to go one step further, which is to flip that and say, that's the opportunity. Say, I can't wait for stocks to go down 20%. Mm. <laughs> right. Your initial reaction is like, well, I don't think I feel that way. But see, if you can train yourself, I can't wait for this to go down 20%. Because I know it's hamburger. It's, the, it's good stuff. And I want to buy it, but I want to buy it when it's cheap. That's what Buffett, I believe, has done at a level that I've just never seen anywhere else. The disaster is opportunity and be ready to invest your money. But if you're all in all the time, you won't have that flexibility. Well, I, I think, agree. Yeah, mm-hmm. personally, you know, I think the biggest example is the late 90s when he wasn't participating in the internet. Mm-hmm. And I mean, some of those meetings, people were brutal. You know, they would say, Warren, you just don't get it anymore. Yeah, how come you don't, how come you aren't doing this? You know, you just don't get it. And, you know, eventually starting in 2000, he announced a stock buyback and he was going to try to be really fair about it. And, and then things, you know, quickly flipped and all of a sudden Berkshire was popular again and he was able to buy, you know, the S&P dropped 30% and he was sitting, looking really good the next three years. Um, and then, you know, in 08, 09, he deployed money. He was the bank. When people were fearful, he, you know, he was, pa- he patiently said, here's the, here's the terms, you know, 9% convert. And, <laughs> and he, he threw that out there. And then he also bought the Burlington Northern. I mean, when. You know, he was, he was, he was, he was uh, being greedy when others were fearful, so to speak. And so, yeah, those are, uh, those are the two things that stick most in my mind. You know, actually in the mid eighties also, he did a huge deal with Cap Cities, you know, mm-hmm. making money. And that's, you know, that, I think that was a big, you know, put him in the spotlight also. That was, that was one of those events, but all of a sudden he deployed an enormous amount of capital. I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly how much that was, but it was a big bet. And uh, so, so he's got the ability to not only be patient, but also to be, when he sees an opportunity to seize it, he, he can see, he sees, he sees the opportunities and, and I, I, you know, I still think he does, but he's kind of hamstrung by size right now. But yeah, that 08, 09 period, maybe at 2010, we calculate he did about a hundred billion dollars of investment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was on, good. To work. Mm-hmm. So if you're taking a really long view, I'm in this for the next 40 years. You should say, I can't wait for volatility because that'll be my chance to really load up on some things. And so you always have cash because that's going to happen and you want to be ready. Now, maybe it's 5% or 10%, but I think people have it flipped upside down. But you don't right. want to be all in all the time. You want to be ready for the volatility we know will come. Mm-hmm. We're going to call the fee for being a term investor. It's actually the opportunity to increase your total rate of return over time. I, I think you're touching on something really interesting, which I would call the difference between the private market and the public market. In the private market, it's harder to find a distressed seller of the business that you can get half off. And if it's a distressed seller, you should probably look carefully why the seller is distressed. There may be something wrong with the business. In the public market, it's, it's crowd mentality. So people panic together. Somehow it's not one person at a time. We all panic at the same time. So you could have quality businesses. And all, very recently in March of 2020, we were looking at some stocks that we ended up buying at sometimes 20-year lows. And those lows didn't last as long as I was hoping. But 
it was pretty incredible. But if it was a privately held business, the owner would not have panicked and sold their business at a 20-year low. In the public market, that's something that happens. And volatility is your friend. And the daily quote that is too much to handle for a lot of people, it's an opportunity for those that can actually patiently buy and, and wait it out. So that's mm -hmm. the beauty of it. And you have to know what you are. That's the other thing. It's, it's, okay. it's, it's back to Corey's point earlier that you own actual businesses and you have to remind yourself that you own the business. The, the other big theme that I, I noticed in your book, and I'm not surprised, is inflation. And almost every meeting or every other meeting, there's something about inflation. And it's almost, you know, I think the memory of the 70s continued in the 80s that inflation will come back. And even those double digit rates that you could get on treasuries, there, there's a line or two in your book somewhere that there was a thought that maybe this is not even enough to compensate for the inflation risk that may follow. That never happened, and we can talk about it more, but I think, you know, globalization, international trade, a lot of different things happened that allowed the prices to actually remain in check, because you can tell me more, what do you think? But today, we actually had some experience with inflation in the US, or most of the world, and the topic is relevant again. But let's talk about inflation. It looks like it was that uh, something that he was afraid of, both of them were concerned about, and it kept coming back as a topic of discussion. I'm curious. What do you think about it over those decades? Yeah, well, the line from Munger I always loved was the fail rate of all great civilization is 100%. Right. Mm -hmm. and now, civilization fails, the currency fails. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other will fail. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> and the impetus to print money as a government body is universal. Such an easy, such a much more palatable way to deal with problems versus saying no. It's really that simple, I think. So to think we'll keep inflating it seems just inevitable. But you're right. Buffett talked about inflation numerous times, and he was just wrong. It didn't really mm -hmm. work out that way. These deflationary forces in the global economy are so much bigger and greater than even he could anticipate. Um, so Corey, do you want to say more about that? As Charlie Munger would say, I have nothing to add. You know, I've really never understood why interest rates do what they do. I've never understood why inflation does what it does. I mean, I've seen money printing. Mm -hmm. In my mind, we should have had much more inflation than we have. I think part of the reason we didn't have inflation, bug well, is be um, the massive rollout of technology. You know, in the early 90s, um, you had this enormous cost-saving thing mm -hmm. happen, the internet. And, right. you know, back in the day, if you had to type something, you, oh, God, when I was in college, you had to use punch cards. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was you know, so that, all that stuff really, really drove costs down in, in so many different ways. So I think that was a big piece of it. And, but now, you know, all that's played out. I don't, I don't know. Maybe AI is the next big thing. Maybe that's going to drive costs down next. But, but mm -hmm. yeah, I don't really understand why that, why that works the way it does. I would be purely speculating. So, yeah. And the beauty of Berkshire and Buffett and Munger and how they've invested is it didn't matter, right? It they didn't were right matter. by inflation. It didn't matter. You know, great bits of on the compound. Yeah. I think, you know, actually, John, Templeton, out with it. yeah, I think John Templeton said it best. He's, he's talking about, investing in South America. And he said, where you had rapid inflation, he said, who would you rather have been? Would you rather have been the uh, owner of the building of the retail store? Or would you have been ra rather been the operator of the store where you could change your prices every day? So if you own the building, you charge rents or or something like that, you couldn't change them as rapidly as this person. So you're, you're in a much true. worse position. So being an equity holder gives you, puts you in a, gives you a, uh, an advantage because you can change your prices quicker than uh, being the debt holder in that situation. Yeah, I so, mean, flexibility, the ability to adapt. That's being, what yeah, being a business owner is still a good place to be, even if we have inflation. Uh, I'll share with you my experience. I mean, 1990, Poland became a free market economy from a centrally planned economy to a free market economy overnight. And uh, the underlying currency went through a hyperinflation. And eventually the IMF helped and there was a plan to switch to a new currency. We took away four zeros from the currency and uh, there was a managed exchange with the dollar and the Deutsche Mark at the time to reestablish confidence in the currency. But a lot of people think when the currency goes away, the, the government and everything implodes. In Poland, if anything, democracy was getting stronger and stronger as the currency was going away. So <laughs> yeah. was, the, the two had nothing to do with each other. People were ready to open businesses, trade, the economy was booming, supermarkets were opening up, everything was, was happening. 
just they had to figure out which currency are we going to do tra transactions and, and you know, a lot of import export with, was with Germany so Deutschmark was Deutschmark was one one of them and and the dollar was the currency for the rest of the trade and if you wanted to buy a car or an apartment you would pay in dollars eventually a few years later people had more confidence in the local currency again with fewer zeros and people stopped doing transactions in the dollar so if the dollar as we know it goes away the need for people to transact whether services or goods will be here and it, us is still uh, you know a huge economy with so many people with so much potential so even if we have to start fresh with a new currency i think will go on but i think it will be very disorienting at the time if it does happen and when it happens that's that's my thought but speaking of predictions i have another question in a lot of the meetings as i'm reading your notes obviously everybody wants to know what's next what's next what's next and even this year everybody wants to know and and Corey said he he's not going to tell us where the interest rates are going that's my feeling from today's <laughs> conversation <laughs> but it's fascinating that every year people want to know what's next what's next what are your thoughts i feel like the lesson is that it's irrelevant the predictions are irrelevant in what buffett and munger have been doing and at the end of the day not knowing where the market will go each year where it will close or what the interest rates will be as long as you continue to buy quality businesses do you have some thoughts about how they feel about predictions well it goes for me it goes back to what could go wrong right it's not about predicting per se but it's what are the risks of something going wrong here and when rates are zero the risk is rates go up mm -hmm. and they go up a lot and they go up fast and if you're betting the other way you're busted right the, Silicon Valley Bank and some of those other banks are up against. In the whole financial industry, as Corey said, we don't know who's been swimming naked yet. Mm -hmm. Yes, there'll be some more problems. The people are on long-term bonds and now they're upside down. So we're a new business, so you're not affected or not, at least not devastated by that kind of turn of events. Like we're going back to inflation. So there are businesses that are devastated by inflation. Mm -hmm. High fixed cost business and your costs go up and you can't raise your prices fast enough. Margin disappears. That's a problem. So what, what do you do about that? So this is a, it really is a lot you can do. Others are capital light and they have lots of pricing power. Mm -hmm. Raise the prices and sometimes even expand margins, which has happened a little bit with this one. And, uh, you know, there's accusations of corporate greed. Well, yeah, that's probably going on. It's in the interest of the company to maximize margins. It's just how it works. So it's worthwhile to know, you know, what can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And it looks like this particular... It's probably more likely than at other times. So let's be extra attentive to guarding against these kind of problems. And so, you know, for the Fed to announce, we're probably going to raise rates. Right. They tried not to take anybody by surprise. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really disappointing to see some of the management decisions that got made. But there's so much momentum. Something's working. Everyone else is doing it. The good times are rolling. You know, mm -hmm. psychologically, it's hard to unwind when the party's going. So, so if I might, I just wanted to highlight our, uh, the appendix, first appendix in our book. I thought it was the best part of the whole book for me. What we do is we studied 1965 to 1969, just that period. That's when Buffett took over Berkshire Hathaway. And he very publicly said it was a mistake. It was a fit of peak. Seabury Stan said, I'll buy your new shares for 11 and a half. Then he sent them a letter. And then they offered 11 and three eighths. So one eighth Buffett was pissed. Right? So I stopped showing yeah. him. He ends up buying the whole company, Stan, he gets kicked out, and he's the dog who caught the car, right? Well, that's a little disingenuous. If you look at what he did, it's spectacular. It's a master class on reallocating capital. Mm -hmm. You know, the textile business has problems, right? That's a, right. But it has assets, right? It has inventory. That can be turned into cash. So in 1965, the book value was $20. Mm -hmm. The earnings were 15 cents a share. In 1969... The book value is $43 and they earn $8 a share. How the heck did that happen? He did something right. <laughs> he did everything right. So he bought in <laughs> under 20,000 shares early on. Mm -hmm. He was going to turn this thing. Uh -huh. So the cap, how smart is that? They had 8 million in tax loss carry forwards. I don't know exactly what he invested in the stock market, but he made a lot of money. He didn't pay much tax. Mm -hmm. because it was shelter. He knew that going in. And then he made two acquisitions that changed the structure of the company. They had national indemnity in 1967, became an insurance company. And in 1969, they bought the Illinois National Bank of Rockford, fantastic bank. So they had two major earnings providers that were real companies that were really solid. 
So about half of that eight bucks was those two companies' earnings that didn't exist in 1960. That's true. So the value at $43, a book value, was even higher than that because it had real earning power. Whereas the textile company was kind of hit and miss. And it had some good years, but it also had a long-term decline going on. Mm-hmm. So he pulled all the levers, capital allocation. And he, he uh, so self-deprecating, right? He says, well, it was a big mistake. In the thunder. It worked out. You know, I think yeah, that he, he made it work. Wow. He, so there's a big lesson. So we, we, we manage money for families and some of the families might be still involved in the original business that created wealth. And there's always a conversation. Should we hold on to this business or should we sell it? And it's, you know, is anybody in the family that wants to run it and so on? So there are many layers to the d- decision and what kind of business it is. Does it have the future potential? And I think the benefit that Buffett had in this situation was that he wasn't married or committed and had no tex- history of the textile business. It was just a business. And he was very ready, as you said, to deploy the cash and the cash flows in a completely different direction. And he already had a plan. And I think that challenge for a lot of families that have grown up with, let's say, you know, textile business around them and stories of the textile business, they're so invested, not just financially, but emotionally into the family story that yeah. doing what Buffett did at that point, which would be wise, exit the original business, move on to something else, is that moment where you can preserve and grow the wealth that was created or watch a slow demise of an industry that's going away. And I think you're touching on something interesting that Buffett witnessed and you write about it in your notes. So many businesses that actually got weaker, weaker and weaker and went away, include, including newspaper businesses and, and not just textile that he exited. And But yeah. Very, very interesting. Corey, you have anything to add? Any prediction for us? Well, well, I would, I, I think the, yeah, I would, of course, make no prediction. But, you know, I, I think, you know, Warren has said, if you buy a stock, you have to be willing to hold it, even if the stock market closes for a year. You know, right. you have to be that, you have, you have to be that sure of it. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure, you know, if I, if I think about it, he has spoken about how people, have this desire throughout the ages to listen to fortune tellers. Mm-hmm. They want to know about the future <laughs> and, and how, you know, uh, people look at the macro concerns and they may not, may or may not make a decision based on that. And he, and he has been very adamant and say, we have never not made a decision because of the macro, always looking at the business opportunity. And so I think, you know, if I were to give advice to, around that, I would say, you know, Practice what you can know and not spend time on the things you can't know. And I think, I think too many people listen to somebody else's wisdom and, and they don't rely enough on their own. You know, they're not investing in themselves or in the research and not understanding what they're owning. And that gets you, that will get you in a tremendous amount of trouble. So don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't listen to those people. Listen to yourself. There are too many experts out there. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. What I like about the meetings, and I, I see it in your book, is those moments when you have younger members of the audience that ask questions, and some of them are really young, and uh, they both have some advice for them. Do you remember some of the, the best advice that Buffett and Munger gave to the younger members of the audience? Corey, just mention one, invest in yourself. <laughs> and that's one, one of invest, them. Invest in yourself, do what you love, tap dance to work, and then only work with people you love and admire. It keeps it pretty simple. Yeah, that's true. I'm blessed to have that for myself. Corey's my best friend and been a great partnership. Yeah, you've been very fortunate. I think it's key to surround yourself with the people you enjoy yeah. and you can trust. And yeah, that's wonderful. And I think what you mentioned at the beginning, then, you know, the habit of saving, that definitely helps. And a certain perception of price and value in life, I think that helps. And it, for some people, it's more intuitive. For some people, it's less. Do you know the Stanford marshmallow experiment? Yes, <laughs> of course. That just fascinates me. And that's, that was so uh, poignant because it's just one thing for a second marshmallow. And our kids couldn't and some kids could. And the ones that could wait did better in life as they tracked their lives. And that's value investing, waiting for the second marshmallow. Delayed gratification. Sometimes it's worth waiting a, a second. I have a big question for you about taxes. And I was reading your book and I kind of feel like there are two sides to the story. One, Buffett, and and you touched on it briefly, how he was using the losses of the textile business to protect the gains that followed. But there are two sides to it. On one hand, and Corey might have some thoughts about it too, how Buffett would take advantage or use all that's available in terms of 
minimizing the tax consequences or deferring the tax consequences of his investment policies. On the other hand, he would go out and say that the rich should be taxed more or that the taxes should be higher, basically. Can you yeah. reconcile the two? Yeah, like, yeah, Corey, he's our yeah, yeah, I would say that, you know, at Berkshire, he would, he's really, out of, even in the 80s, I mean, I remember that was just when you could start ordering things online, you know, from out of state, then you'd get them and you wouldn't have to pay sales tax. Mm -hmm. Then you'd have to file use tax. And he's very adamant, you know, telling the managers, you, we will pay the use tax to the state of Nebraska, you know, that kind of thing. So he always wanted to pay the taxes he owed. And yet I do feel like he does feel like he has a duty to the shareholders at Berkshire to minimize taxes to the extent that he can. So I think there, there's some, somewhat of a paradox. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, when they reduced corporate taxation in the 80s, he talked about, well, that's just going to be a transfer of wealth from the government to corporations. It's not going to change in corporations. And yet he did take full advantage of that too. So I, I don't think, I think, you know, his personal feeling about wealth, uh, wealth accumulation and wealth distribution in, in the United States, uh, well, it should be pretty, pretty obvious, you know, that, that there is this, we have an unbalanced society, so to speak, wealth right. Um I don't, but I think from a business standpoint, he's going to, he's going to play the game as hard as he does anything else. I mean, I remember we had a tax manager at Berkshire and he said, you know who the best tax person is here, don't you? And he said, well, you are, aren't you? He said, <laughs> no, it's, it's clearly it's Warren. He knows every tax because he has, you know, a photographic memory. He remembers everything. So, but uh, that, that's what that's. So I, I just think, you know, he, he tries to pay his fair share, but he's not going to overpay either. Right. Yeah. Yes. Well, ideally the, the tax law is carefully considered policy mm -hmm. to maximize the benefits for the whole of the civilization. Right. That's See, true. And so one of the best tax benefits available to all of us are long-term capital gains. Taxes deferred until you sell. And if you never sell, the compounding's infinite. Hey, I, I think there was some discussion of uh, maybe taxing those gains, unrealized gains at some point in 21, right. uh, 22, when the market was really uh, flying high. I haven't heard the discussion since. I think it's hard to execute, uh, the, but mm -hmm. who knows? I mean, again, public, I can't predict the future. <laughs> I thought a transaction public, was really hard. The public yeah. good in that is it promotes long-term ownership of American business exactly. and understanding American economics and business and being pro American civilization. I mean, that's nice. the idea. Yeah. yeah. If you're trading all the time, you don't experience what that is. Yeah. So Berkshire has a large tax deferred item on their balance sheet, which we mm -hmm. count equity because he's unlikely to ever sell. That's very true. So, well, uh, um, well, I think I'll just leave it at that because taxes get so complicated. No, that's, that's true. But I, I, but I it's think it's incentives, right? If we create incentives that create the world we want, we'll do well develop counter uh, intuitive processes and actually damage things than we haven't done. Mm -hmm. So it's really fault of the policy of the system that needs to be examined. What, what, kind of out, what kind of outcomes it can generate? I think that's where you're going with it. Right. So effects have effects. Mm -hmm. You know, Garrett Hardin's book, Filters Against Folly. I've heard of it. I haven't read it. No. So you must read that one. It's <laughs> a, one of Munger's big recommendations, I don't know, 30 years ago. Uh-huh. This blew my mind. So Garrett Hardin was a professor of uh, uh, environmental studies at Santa Barbara. So he just thought very differently and very big. The three filters are um, numeric, literate, and accurate. Okay. So uh, filter says, what are the numbers? And more than that, what do the numbers mean? Uh -huh. The literate uh, filter says, what are the words? And what do the words really mean? Uh -huh. And the accurate filters, and then what? What are the six? Mm -hmm. the effects. And one of my favorite moments is Corey and I were in uh, Canada studying the oil industry. They got to build this giant rig off the north of Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. so all rigs ever built and they could withstand, you know, a two ton iceberg. And you know, they're very proud of their project. Corey gets up and says, well, what happens if it gets hit by a three ton iceberg? It quiet. You know, and then what? Right. And then, and then what? what? They had thought about a three ton iceberg clearly because they, didn't answer the question. They need uh, icebergs get, but maybe two times was plenty. Well, of course, you got up and asked the difficult question. If you thought big enough, but what could go wrong? I, I think it's it's Except a theme. 
Yeah, it's a theme in this conversation. What can go wrong? And to be prepared yeah. for it <laughs> just in case. If you're prepared at the outset, then when it happens, you're not comfortable, but you're like, okay, I can roll with this. As opposed to freaking out and, oh my God, I'm ruined. And I think the lesson is be ready to be surprised and, and minimize the surprises. And it's less about the prediction in the sense that I know what the interest rates will be next year. It's more that if they are this or that extreme, I could still continue with my business. I think that's that's the theme for both as a business manager and as an investor. In the worst case, am I still going to be fine? And it's the cash argument that you mentioned, but it's all the different components that we talked about. I, I have one of the last few questions, and the big theme for Buffett and Munger is the ethical standards, the ethics. So so they go way beyond of what the rules are, and, and you touched on it, how they have so many discussions of the accounting rules, but then they, they say how it doesn't co capture the true economic reality and so on, but also how they treat people in the business, they how, how they operate. Can you talk about that? Both of you, I'm curious what your perception and experience is over those decades of in a world where we think it's so competitive and so cutthroat, you have two individuals that, first of all, want to do everything by the book, <laughs> not, not cut any corner. I think it's a lesson for all of us and an aspiration. Yeah. Well, the, what pops for me is the Solomon Brothers scandal. Right. I believe that made Buffett's reputation. Mm -hmm. And the joke he told at the annual meeting after that, I still remember, was there's a guide at SeaWorld and they're standing by the shark pool. He tells the, the guests, there's a million dollar reward if anyone swims across this pool, but no one's it. <laughs> suddenly there's a splash and there's this wild paddling and splashing. Sharks are nipping at this guy's heels and he jumps out of the water and he makes it. And the tour guy said, oh my God, you're the first one. You won a million dollars. What are you going to do with your million dollars? The guy said, well, first thing I'm going to do is hire a detective, find the son of a bitch who pushed me in. <laughs> I remember that. Mm -hmm. so Buffett got pushed to operate at a level he'd never been forced to operate before. Right. On a national level, and he testified before Congress. Mm -hmm. That video just rings in my head. I, I remember well, that. And it's money, and I will be understanding. Lose one shred of reputation, and I will be ruthless. He drew the line for yeah. every, everyone in his sphere. The company, Berkshire itself, Solomon, anyone who walked his way, this is the line. Mm -hmm. I think that Catapult, yeah. but his, his uh, reputation in the mind of American business. And because he got replayed, it's been reinforced. Yeah, and I, and I, I would say, you know, if you look at all the businesses he has purchased over time, especially family businesses, because these people do not have to work. Right. <laughs> Most of them are, are way past the point where they have to work. So I think Warren, um, you know, he says, I will leave you alone. You know, I will let you run this business forever. You don't do worry about your employees. Um, I will, I'll treat them really well. And he does. And so because of that reputation, he's been able to buy businesses all over the world. It's very true. People trust him. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity costs going the other way. So, you know, I'm sure selling was just hell for one, for a couple of years there. And he couldn't not do it. Mm -hmm. it every day, it was intense uh, under national scrutiny, right? So the opportunity cost and all the other investing he might've done in those two years, you know, got blown. So there's a cost to not being in a web of trust. There's a cost to not holding the line. I'm shred a reputation and I will be ruthless. It, it's worth holding the line. There's a payoff, which is you get to do what you're best at. And you don't have to go out and put out fires and yeah. deal with the, the chaos. And I, you know, it was interesting. I was thinking the other day, well, just how many people are still so I left Berkshire almost 31 years ago. Mm -hmm. I worked, I, you know, I worked in Omaha at, you know, um, I was just thinking how many people who I worked with are still there. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's amazing to me, the number of people I worked with who are still there. And I think, you know, there, there is a culture there that, uh, builds, you know, um, you know, people want to stay. They, they, they just really want to stay there. And I think you. To do that, I think you really have to have an ethical, very ethical business because otherwise people would just, you know, take the money and run, so to speak. And it's know? it's a, a lifelong loyalty to the business, to your clients. Yeah. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm i 42 and I've been in the investment business for 18 years. And all of this time I've been with the same team, which is very unusual for anybody that I was graduating with. They've been at 12 different firms, two years and a half at each and uh, really? jumped around. <laughs> 
that wow. that was that was the theme for a lot of people and they kept asking me why are you still with the same team and i think i got really lucky i very fortunate to be working with the team that i enjoyed with mm-hmm. the clients that we that we enjoy as well and that value what we do and i think it's it's a little bit of luck but i think the i was looking for something that would be a permanent choice for me and i didn't know if it will be the first place i find out of grad school i was fortunate enough to have found the people and the place that served me so well and i hope it continues to do so and the clients that bring in some assets from outside they say the firm that serviced some of the assets outside they would call you know three times and talk to five different people because they rotate so much and the, the person comes and the people come and go and he says at your firm it's always a handful of you and i know that you know everything there is to know about me and and help me best and i think that's something across the board when we invest in businesses i see that turnover among the ceos is so high I go to the same conference every few years and I see it's a different collection of people. I know those businesses better than that CEO does because <laughs> they've been there for six months. <laughs> yeah. So I think we can all learn from it. One last question. I always like to ask about the definition of success. I'm very curious, uh, Dan, Corey, what's, what's your definition of success? I, you know, I think my definition would be just, you know, I have a circle of people who love me and people I love and the circle gets bigger, and to me, that's the definition the definition of success. I've got a great family, and uh, I've been very, very fortunate with my friends, partners. And it doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't get any better than that for me. I love the sound of that. Yeah. What about you, Dan? Yeah, I, I think every human wants to love and be loved and feel like they make a difference and be part of something greater than themselves. Yeah, I feel the same way Corey does. I have two grandkids. They're my superstars. Six and <laughs> four. Love my time with them. Uh, and I teach meditation, which I enjoy doing very much. Oh, wow. I think it helps in investing, doesn't it? Absolutely. To investigate your own mind, that's really what Zen is. And start pulling it apart. Why do we do the irrational things we do? How does my mind actually work? And it gets cleaner, clearer as you do that. When did you get into that field? Was it early on or was it later on? Early? Uh, I did my first seven-day silent retreat in 2008. Mm-hmm. Get, the, get the mind clear. Interesting timing. <laughs> I thought about it for years and I never meditated more than 20 minutes in my life. Uh-huh. It was just nuts. jumping in the deep end, but I figured I'm never going to do it. I just don't go. Uh-huh. Zen master named Jewel Roshi uh, had my full attention. He was an amazing human being. You just walk in a room and you're like, well, wait a minute, who's that guy? He just had this presence and he said, it's going to be tough, but if you stay with it for four or five days, you'll know what we're talking. About. Okay. So I asked him my back hurt, my knees hurt, and I wasn't used to sitting on the floor. And that's just how it goes. And sure enough, the fourth or fifth day, my body starts kind of vibrant. Mm-hmm. And everything's beautiful, colors seemed brighter, food tasted better. So it was the same. What well, happened? Yeah, it was me. Taking mind to calm down deeply enough and long enough, this truer, deeper nature of who I am. It, I, I love the sound of it, and I can relate. I, I gave a talk in Zurich only a few weeks ago to a group of investors, and it was about lessons from the COVID time. And one of the topics I talked about was meditations, moments of stillness. And hey. there was there was a, a neuroscientist in the audience who walked up to me at the end, and he said, we have studies that show that this actually works. And I said, I don't think I need studies, although I, I'll read them. I, I can tell it works. Well, Jill Bolte Taylor, a stroke of insight. I have heard the name. I'll, I'll add it to my list. She's a had a stroke. Mm-hmm. So she's examining her own stroke. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Science, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, one mm-hmm. of the biggest TED Talks ever given. I remember. Mm-hmm. She's come out with a new book called uh, Whole Brain Living. And basically says, yeah, the left brain's analytical, linear. Thinking, language, numbers all come from. And then the right brain is spatial and open and creative. It's where joy and, and aliveness reside. And in her stroke, the left brain collapsed. She just right. was, it was glorious, but she knew she was dying. Oh, kind of the I'm dying. I've probably yeah. been some milk, but I've never been so happy. And then she's just taken that and continued to work it as a neuroscientist. So yeah, yeah it's, it's physiological. Yeah. Slow down. Yeah, breathe deeply. Our body relaxes. Or our body relaxes better. Calmer. I, I, is your, yeah. is your I think we can, uh, well, there's a lot we can still learn on that front and deploy it not only in investing, but I think in life in general. 
Dan, Corey, this was wonderful. I really enjoyed this conversation and thank you so much for being so generous with your time. I'm going to include the, the links to your book and your resources and some of the titles you mentioned as well in the notes to the episode. But thank you again for your time today. I, I had a great time talking to you. Yeah, thank you very much. It was very enjoyable. Camille, you're a good listener. I really uh, appreciate it. That is a rare quality and a fantastic quality to have. So thank you. Thank you. I, I think it helps in my, my work. I spend so much time sitting down with clients and actually hearing them out. How is it that I can help? You know, we buy stocks that go up. Yes, that's the, the aspiration, but they play, they play a role in people's lives. Right? That's how I think of it. And to actually sit down and, and listen, like, how is it that we can actually help? I think that plays a big role, especially in moments of distress, like the COVID crash. I think these were the times when Clients would call me and would say, I just want to hear your voice. I said, oh, that's very nice of you, but I'm going to get back to work and, and keep buying stocks. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Yeah, Great to meet you, Bogdan. Great to meet you as well. You were listening to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question, what it means to live a rich life beyond money. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and follow, subscribe, rate, and share with friends and family. We rely on word of mouth to promote the show. One click for you means the world to us. Thank you. Until next time, your host, Bogumil Baranowski. The content of this podcast is for general informational purposes only, and so are the opinions of members of Seacard Associates, a registered investment advisor, and guests of the show. This podcast does not constitute a recommendation to buy or sell any specific security or financial instruments or provide investment advice or service. Past performance is not indicative of future results. More information on Seacard Associates is available in its Form ADV disclosure documents available at advisorinfo.sec.gov.